following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let us bring living souls out onto the earth. This lecture is related to the sixth day of Genesis, a day that embraces very profound mysteries related with, with what we already uh, are talking about, which are the different aspects of the soul, which uh, we're going to extend today since it is related with living souls. Let us remember how we explained that the first soul consciousness or intelligence that we find related with Kabbalah, with the book of Genesis, is the soul called Yehida which is always mentioned in the days of Genesis when the, it is explained and uh, it was so. This it was so is written in Hebrew, Yehi which refer to Yehida. It means that so the light of Yehida was so or became. Because in many lectures we explain that this word Yehi from Yehida relates to that uh, phrase spoken by God to Moses. Eheye, Asher, Eheye, which becomes, in the translation is, I become, who becomes. And this is very interesting because the lecture today is related with who. That is a share in Hebrew, which backwards means rush, which is head. And that relates to the Holy Spirit, Bina. So I becomes is Keter. Who becomes? is Bina, which we explained relates to the second 
soul or intelligence that is called Haya. So Haya and Yehira is that uh, or are those intelligences that relate to the space, to light. Yehira is light that relates to the three first sephiroths, Keter, Chochma, Bina, or the tree of life, plus the unknowable divine Ein Sof, which is called Hey. So that is the unity that in Kabbalah is called Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, the holy name of God. And the light in between them is Or in Hebrew, which refers to Yehida. That intelligence that expresses itself within the unknowable and within the Logos, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, that is, of course, in the abstract space. It's formless. And then we find another type of intelligence that is also formless, within the void, which is higher, which we explain is Akash in Sanskrit, and what the Bible call water. When we talk about water, we always address the different aspects of the Divine Mother. And of course, Haya hides the duality of the unity, which relates to that commandment, you shall honor your father and your mother, which are of course translated as Yod Hava in the Bible. That relates to Bina, the Holy Spirit. This duality contains Yehida, or as we say in Sanskrit, Akash contains the Prana. So Akash and Prana in Sanskrit is Haya and Yehida together. Because this blue substance called Akash is diluted in the universe. From that Akash, as we explained in previous lecture, crystallizes any unity in the universe. Call it planet, sun, comet, etc. To understand this better, let us say, light the salt diluted in the ocean is that formless water in comparison to understand it. So when that salt is together, it forms different types of concrete matter. But that salt is within the water. <coughs> and this is what we have to understand in order to understand that dry land that the book of Genesis talk about. And in that dry land appear the vegetation, plants, that are of course related with those elements that are necessary to exist upon any dry land that are transformers of the energy that we call Yehida. That's why it is written in the book of Genesis that and Yehi was so when the trees, plants appear in the third day. And from that light 
that is the outcome of the transformation of the land, dry land, mineral kingdom, and the plant kingdom, comes the marvelous light that we see that forms the atmosphere of any planet. Lights that are in the space. Diluted, of course, into that water that we call Akash. So, in the previous lecture, we explained how those waters that are everywhere in the fourth dimension, that Akash transform into Tadwas, and the tatwas are the soul of the elements. The akash is that water that uh, Genesis says, let us, or let the waters bring forth living soul. That we talk in the last lecture. Those living souls, or the fifth lecture we explained, emerge from the elements, the tatwas, and are precisely what we call in esotericism the elementals of plants and minerals that are, of course, the intelligence of every plant, of every herb, of every mineral that uh, work in the transformation of Yehida in any planet. In that fourth dimension, we find, of course, as we see in the graphic, the first graphic that is related with that uh, beautiful painting of Midsummer Night Dream, which relates, of course, with these living souls that we are talking about. And that's why we took these graphics in order to explain it, since visual pictures in art, uh, of course, uh, recorded in our minds in order to understand this better. So the picture that we see there are all those multitudes of elementals, consciousness from the tatuas the elements that are in the fourth dimension. And uh, there is a part of the Divine Mother who is the fifth, the fifth aspect that is called the elemental magi or the fairy mother, which in this case is represented by Titania. In that... Uh, story of Shakespeare. This uh, aspect of the Divine Mother relates always to water. When we talk about the Divine Mother, remember, we address her to re related with the letter Mem, water. Because she is there. Water in any aspect. So the elemental fairy Maggie, Mother, relates, listen carefully, to the sexual instinct, to the sexual power in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, and in the human kingdom. So when we address the sexual energy, we address the fifth aspect of the Divine Mother, that which in tales for children is called the fairy godmother. And that we think, oh, it's just a tale in order to entertain children. But let me tell you that that elemental aspect of the Divine Mother exists in each one of us. There is not a single person without that aspect within. So this is really 
beautiful symbol of the, of the Divine Mother that is present any time that we are performing the sexual act. So, as we see, or as we studied the last lecture, we arrive in the fifth day in which uh, the souls are in the fourth dimension related to water. But now the sixth day is stating, let us bring those living souls from the fourth dimension, out from the fourth dimension, and let us place them out onto the earth. And this is precisely the topic of this lecture. Because as the book of Genesis explained, we see that uh, from the next graphic, which is another beautiful graphic related to, to Quan Yin, which is, of course, the very essence of Yin, the Divine Mother. You know, Yin Yang, Yang is masculine and Yin is feminine. So, this is Quan Yin, dancing in the style of Shiva. If you recall, that is a graphic of Shiva <coughs> dancing in that way. It's because Quan Yin is uh, really Parvati, the wife of Shiva in Hinduism. And her dance relates to that dance in which she is working with the light in order to bring down the souls into the physical plane. Of course, the dance of Quan Yin is the same dance of Shiva. Because remember that Shiva in Quan Yin represents father, mother, or in other words, Haya, the duality of that light. In the graphic, the, the first graphic, we find the holy name of God hidden in Yod Hei, which are the, the two fairies, King and Queen Fairy, which is <coughs> Titania or Titania. And Oberon, the two aspects, Yod Hei. And the other Bav Hei, of course, are the men and the women that are sleeping there, that we call them uh, Adam and Eve, Bav Hei. So the four aspects, above and below. This is how we had to see it. Because the duality above of Yod Hei becomes Bav Hei below that we call men woman Adam and Eve that is related of course with this uh, lecture because in the sixth day is where Adam is created but let us first go before because the first uh, the sixth day of Genesis states and Ella Jam Ela Yam, as we explained in previous lecture, means the sea goddess. <coughs> it's because we are addressing Malkut, which is the very bottom of the tree of life. And as we explained in previous lecture, Malkut is the outcome of the left side of the tree of life. When we address Malkut, we address also the moon, which is always related to the left side, because the sun in the tree of life relates to the right side. So the left is the woman, is the moon. 
we emerge from the moon, which is a woman, physically speaking. Our body is Malkut, which is feminine, as we always explain. So therefore, the verse of the Bible states, Let us bring Nefesh Haya, living souls, out onto the earth according to Mina, sex. That's the translation. Because the translators put according to their kind, which means also the same. We will say, let us bring these living souls onto the earth according to their, the, the kind of sex, their kind of sex that they have. Because without the sexual energy, no souls can come into the earth. And you know that. Because we came from sex, but in that sexual act, that that we call nefesh, was connected to the sperm in the very moment of gestation. And together with the ovum, the fetus developed, and the soul is in that dimension, the superior dimension, waiting for that earth to be formed in order to enter into it, which is the physical body. That happens not only to us, but to every single physical element in this three-dimensional world. Of course, the sixth day of Genesis is addressing those creatures that relate to the earth, physically speaking. Mainly those souls that incarnate into physical bodies and that we call it or call them animals. The word in the Bible, Haya, means life, but also means animal, beast, brute. And this is something very significant. The plural of Haya is Hayot. And we have, uh, as we mentioned in the last lecture, this prayer that we said, Hayot HaKadosh, which means the holy animals or the holy creatures, the holy beasts, which in the book of Ezekiel are an eagle, an ox, a lion, and a human being or an angel. Those, of course, relate to the superior aspect of nefesh, haya. Because when we said nefesh, physically speaking, we are related to the blood, to the skin, the very soul that sustains the life of the physical body is called nefesh. Remember that we said that every atom, physical atom, is a trio of matter, energy, and consciousness. So when we are addressing here the consciousness of the atom in the physical plane, we are talking about nefesh. That nefesh is that soul that evolves from the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and finally, the intellectual animal kingdom. And uh, that's why when we said Nefesh Haya, we are specifically addressing the physicality, Hayot, Haya. From this word that means life and animal, comes another word, Haim, which is plural as well, but masculine. 
This is how the tree of life is called in Hebrew. Oats tree. Chaim. Which is a plural of life, of Haya. So Oats Chaim is a tree of life related to all of that which is perfect in the tree of life. But Hayot is plural related to the lower aspect. Malkut. And also to Hod, Netzah, Yesod, the four lower sephiroth of the tree of life. Hayot. But when we refer to Haim, superior, which is precisely what the Bible says. You want to eat from the tree of life? Well, you don't have to eat from the fruit of good and evil. That fruit of knowledge of good and evil is mina, sex. And who are those that eat from the tree of good and evil? Are they Hayot, related with cattle, and creeping thin, and beast of the earth, according to Mina, sex. So, in the tree of life, you find... You find it at the very bottom of these 12 uh, graphics, the tree of life. The left side of the tree of life, as you see, is Bina, Gebura, Hod, Yasod, and Malkut. We are addressing Malkut, the earth, from where all the souls have to come from, right? They're coming from the superior worlds, from Yasod into Malkut, according to Mina. This is how we come into this world, according to Mina. So, when in Kabbalah we address the left side, we address Bina, as you see, which is Haya, the duality, father-mother, that descend into that in order to originate the world of creation. And from there descend into Gebura, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. In Gebura, as we explained in previous lectures, we have Neshama, the third type of soul that relates to the human being. Because the human being is Chesed, Geburah, Tiferet, Netzah, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. The seven lower Sephiroth relates to the man called Adam. That Adam is Chesed. That is created. But also that Adam becomes Moses when the individual creates as we explained in the previous lecture, the causal body. When we create the causal body, and then we have to write the, of, to be called Adam. Before that, we are not have the right to call man or Adam or human being. Because then we reach the second triangle of the tree of life that relates to the particular individual unity that we have within, that is called monad in Greek. The individual monad of each one of us. Well, within that monad is Gebura, that we call the spiritual soul, that in Sanskrit is called Buddhi. And within that Buddhi, spiritual soul, Gebura, is Neshama, which is called the spiritual soul. If you observe the word Neshama in Hebrew, is written Nun, Shin, Mem, Hey. 
if you take the first letter nun and then you remain with the word or the name Mo Moshe Moses so the only difference between the Shama and Moses word words is the letter nun that's why it is stated that Moses is the one that controls Neshama. And it is like that. Because Tifereth, Moses, the human soul, the causal body, is the one that has to reunite all the elements of Neshama that in the human being is called Israel. And this Israel is the image of Yehida. So, the image of God is written that the man was made into the image of God. Yehida is light. And that light reflects in Neshama. But it does it through Haya. The duality of mother and father. In, the, in other words, the image of Yehida, that is called Salem in Kabbalah, in Hebrew, the Salem of God, of Yehida, descends into Haya, father, mother, and they deposit that into Hesed. And Hesed then develops according to Gebura, which is that Neshama. So this is why in Kabbalah we state that Israel is in the universe, diluted in the space because it relates to Yehida. So that Israel as, a, as an image, Salem, descends into Haya, into the Holy Spirit, and then into the monad of each one of us as Neshama. Those are what we call the archetypes that will mold Adam, the human being, into the image of God, if we know how. Unfortunately, when descending Gebura into the physical world, since those archetypes are not completely developed, Gebura only sends one spark, what we call the Buddha Datu in Buddhism, that we call the essence, the embryo of soul. In that embryo of soul descends into Hod, Yasod, and Malkut. And this is what we are, an embryo of soul that when we reach the level in which we are, we can develop all the archetypes if we know how. Because the rest of the animals that we find here in the physical world, they have also that essence. But they don't have the capability of developing it because they don't have intellect. The intellect, reasoning, is that faculty that nature gives us free in order for us to work with our neshama, with those archetypes. Animals and creeping things, they don't have that ability because they don't use their intellect in the right way. <coughs> That's why in Kabbalah you find that Gebura is ruled by Samael. And Samael is that power related with fire. In previous lecture we talked about the exorcism of water the exorcism of the air in Latin. The exorcism of fire is very simple. It relates to T 
Tiferet, Geburah, and Hod. This triangle made into the left. Because in Kabbalah, south, which is the left of the tree of life, relates to fire. We said in the exorcism of fire, Michael, which is Tiferet, king of the sun and of lightning. Samael, Geburah, king of volcanoes and earthquakes. And then we descend into Hod. Anael, prince of the astral light, assist me in this conference about the souls because all of that is related with them. In the Sohar, they say that Samael has the power of the serpent because really he hides a secret also of death which is annihilation. And when the individual eats from the forbidden fruit, the angel of death, they said, which is Geburah, acts under the command of Bina, which is above, which is translated in the Bible as Jehovah Elohim, or Jotchava Elohim. This is Samael, Sabaot. Below here, we find Anael in Hod, which the Sohar states, the negative aspect of Hod, which is the eighth sphere of the tree of life, is called Lilith. In this state that before Eve was created, Adam was having sexual relationships with Lilith. But not only Lilith, also with Nama, which is Yesod, the two lower Sephiroth. So Hod is Lilith and Yesod is Nama. So through Lilith and Nama, in the animal kingdom, descend the souls into Malkut. We have to understand and comprehend that Lilith relates, I mean, relates to the animal behavior, which is fornication. And Nama also. So these are the two wives of Adam before having Eve as a wife. And uh, let me tell you, there is not a single person in this world without those aspects within. We have Lilith and Nahema, psychologically speaking, inside of us. So if we don't work with those animal aspects, psychological aspects, we will continue being in the world of beasts. Hayot, as simple individuals destined to the will of Samsara. That's why uh, it is written in the second uh, graphic let us bring Nefesh Haya, you see living souls out onto the earth according to Mina sex. That's the first phrase. This Nefesh Haya, living souls, relates to the archetypes of Israel. It's a commandment to the initiate. It should be written. Let us bring the archetypes of Israel out onto the earth according to Mina, sex. Because it's a sexual work that we have to do in order to bring them inside of us. But the second statement says, cattle and creeping thin and beast of the earth according to Mina, sex. So you see, there are two 
kinds here of individuals that come into the earth. The creeping thing, cattle and beast of the earth, relate, of course, cattle, behema. This is how it's called. We find that in the third graphic. But it is stated. In uh, Ela Yam, the cigars brought about Hayot of the earth, according to Mina sex. This Hayot of the earth, according to Mina sex, I repeat, relates to initiates. Because our physical body is Haya. Is an animal. We are animals, physically speaking. But according to our sex, we can bring down the souls of Israel, our archetypes, into our physicality. But then it is stated, and behema, according to mina sex. This word behema is a singular for behemoth. You hear that word? Behemoth is plural. Behema is singular. It refers to any creature with four legs. But there is also behema creatures with two legs that walk. They are really still beasts because only a behema, only the behemoth, reach the spasm or the orgasm related with Lilith and Nahema, the two women that were Mary Adam before the creation of Adam. So that's why we find in this planet Earth that the whole humanity are children of Lilith and Nahema. Behemoth. There are many types of behemoth. As you see there in the graphic, a donkey is a behema. But when I said behema, I cannot avoid to bring into my mind the word nahema. Or naema, naama, which means beauty, physical beauty. Behold, this humanity is identified with physical beauty. We will call it Behema Nahema. Relate to the moon. In this day and age, everybody wants to have a bodybuilder body. Strong. Even women are now trying to be physically in shape. Identify with their physicality. That's behema or behemoth. And even with their sexuality. When somebody has a nice shaped body, he says, oh, look how sexy he or she is. Because nahema is related with sex, of course. The magnetism of the animal magnetism of behema or behemoth relates to the physicality, whose power is in the solar plex, fire. And of course, that is related with that graphic that we see there. That uh, if we investigate the human being in the internal planes, what type of soul they have, you may see physically the shape of a human being, but internally they are like that. Bottom is the name of that uh, donkey in that story. Very intellectual. The one that transforms into that donkey is a is an is a actor. A certain thing that they are doing in, in that story of Shakespeare. 
And it's because the intellectual animal relates to donkey. It's a symbol of the donkey. It's at that donkey that Jesus of Nazareth rides in order to enter triumphant into Jerusalem. But to ride the donkey is one thing. Another thing is when the donkey is riding the soul, which is what happened in this day and age. Behemoth. And the donkey, of course, is a symbol of sexuality. Men that become proud of their body and even of their sexual power. Related to Behema, Nahema. Because behind this graphic you see women that are very dressed, identified with their vanity, with their beauty, which is called Nahama, Nahema. Physicality. Completely materialized. Unfortunately, our humanity is like that. But we have to understand that. That those elements exist in every one of us. Sad is the one that developed that. Like in this humanity. They only want to develop the physicality. Children of Naima. And the, the worst are the creeping things. Because also said third, and everything that creepeth onto the earth according to Mina sex. What is that creeping thing? Are the children of Lilith. But children of Lilith are also those that develop witchcraft, sorcery. All of that related with the ego, with the animal. And some of them become very psychic, clairvoyant. We have creeping things studying Kabbalah. In many religions, we find creeping things that creepeth, like the serpent. Tempting serpent of Eden, of course. So... This is very common because uh, in this day and age, we find a lot of people that are very identified with esotericism and develop powers, but they are fornicators. According to Mina, sex, they think that they go or they will go to heaven by behaving like animals. But you see how the sixth day of Genesis is making a difference. One thing is to develop the Hayot HaKadosh according to Mina, sex, which we are teaching here, how to develop the archetypes. And another thing is to develop Behema and the keeping thing according to Mina, which is very common. We have been doing this through centuries. And there are many creeping things that are very knowledgeable of Kabbalah, esotericism, religions, in other aspects. Because every religion is phallic. The origin of any religion is phallic, which means it comes from the phallus, for the positive aspect. And develops in the uterus, which is represented in the physical world as a church, temple, synagogue, mesquite. That's a feminine aspect. That's why in Gnosticism, we pronounce... Two sacred words. In order to emphasize that, we said, Kirie Fale means the holy phallus. And then we said, Kirie Mitras, which is the holy womb. Those who say that only the phallus is the origin of religion are wrong. Because the phallus without a womb, without a uterus, can do nothing. 
So we have the power as men or the phallus, but we need the uterus in order to create. And that's why in order to develop any religion or any philosophy, when the phallus is acting in accordance to mina, according to the superior phallus, that superiority is symbolized in the circumcision. What do you think in the circumcision the skin of the phallus is cut? It's a symbol of cutting the animal that we have. Because there is not a single person with that animality within. To cut the skin of the phallus, to circumcise it, means to cut that animality and to enter into the superior type of sexuality. Of course, we will say that not all the people that have the circumcision in the physical world are doing that. That's why Paul of Tarsus states, one thing is the circumcision in the physical body, and another thing is the spiritual circumcision, which means the creation of that spiritual man inside through the transmutation of mina sex. Because if we just continue fornicating, spilling the seed like the animals or the creeping things, because the creeping thing is also a black tantra. There are certain creeping humans, or we will say it, animals there, that teach black tantra how to develop psychic powers through black tantra, means with the ejaculation of the sexual energy like the animal. That's no difference. That develops the tempting serpent of Eden called Kundabafer. So creeping things are very abundant in this day and age of Kali Yuga. And also creeping things that reject the opposite sex, thinking that they can develop by rejecting, by hating the sexual act. And that's wrong. Because if we come as beasts into this physical world through the sexual act, also in order to enter in the, in the kingdom of heaven, it is necessary to be born by the action of the water and the spirit. You see, the sexual energy of the divine mother. Because when we said water, we are addressing the divine mother. And the father too. Me and ma. Father, mother. Honored. So, that's why it is written there in the bottom. And El Hayam. You see, I am not saying here El Hayam. I'm saying El Hayam. And El Hayam means the sea god. This is masculine. So that it was good. Because the transformation of what we are talking about here, whether as an animal or as an initiate, is necessary for nature. Because nature is a living organism that needs to be fed. For an animal to fornicate and to spill the sexual energy, that's natural in the animal kingdom. Nature doesn't care about it. Whether this animal is irrational or rational, it's okay. Because nature is subsisting with that transformation. It's good, in other words. But if we do it for our own benefit, that is also good. But in a spirit. Not in the mechanical manner. Behold there, that beautiful donkey sharing the power of sex with other fairies there, but obviously is a behemoth. The behemoth according to Mina, sex. <coughs> so, there is another uh, myth 
in which the magician is transformed into a donkey. It's called the golden ass of Apuleius. A very beautiful in which you recognize and admit that you are a donkey. But you want to become a human being. And the whole story is the story of that donkey, Apuleius, that transformed into a donkey. But this is us, in other words. Symbolically speaking, all of us are Apuleius, donkeys. That since childhood are always proud of sex and talking about sex and how many women or how many men, etc., etc., like Nahema, like Behema. And this is a humanity. Observe. Everybody is proud and vain of their own sexuality. The most beautiful, according to society, the physical body looks, more appears in newspapers, in magazines, in the website. Look this Behema, how sexy he or she is. And of course, he's a donkey, male or female, symbolizing that. Very easy. To stop being a donkey is very difficult. And that's precisely why we place this next picture, the number five, in which we explained the duality or the force of the serpent. And we talked about that in the previous lecture in relation with the word tanin, which in the dictionary said is translated as crocodile. But also in the Bible appears as serpent. Precisely in the book of Exodus, chapter 7, verse 9, is stated that God is telling Moses, So take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and he shall become a serpent. And the word that is written there is tanin. You may say it will become crocodile. The thing is that tanin is related to any animal related to the water. In this case, a serpent. And of course, It is written in Exodus chapter 2, 9 and 10. And the serpent woman of Levi, because remember that the mother of Moses was a woman from Levi. And from that name comes Levi Tanin or Leviathan, in other words. And it says that it grew and she brought him unto the Pharaoh's daughter. The Pharaoh's daughter the Mizrahim, the physical world, is a sexual force in the physical body. This is how the goodwill, Moses, grow, being nursed by the physicality, the daughter of the Pharaoh. And she calls his name Moshe, or Moses, because I drew him out of the water Behold the graphic there of that serpent, which in this case is that serpent that was healing the Israelites in the wilderness. It's not the tempting serpent. It's the other polarity of the serpent that in Hinduism is called Naga. Behold he, the two women, floating with Krishna, which in this case symbolizes the same Moses. Same symbol. And the serpent is taking him out of the water. And in his hand he has the flute. That flute are the seven notes of the spinal column. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si. The seven chakras. Which of course is the same rod. Because in that medulla spinal column rises the kundalini. Which is the power of the magician. This is how Krishna is born. This is how Moses is born. The causal body. The Bodhisattva in each one of us. 
Now in the next graphic, 6, we find uh, another beautiful picture of Moses before the burning bush, which is a causal body. And God telling him, Eh ye, Asher, Eh ye, I become who becomes. Remember that when he said who, we are addressing Haya. Keter is I become, or the force that becomes. And who becomes is Haya, which is the same Trinity expressing itself in different aspects. Moses, of course, is covering his face. Right? He has no daring to see God face to face. He's seeing it, but at the same time he's avoiding it. It reminds me when Cain killed Abel. And Cain says to God, now everyone to, that finds me want, want to kill me. So from your face I will be hid. Hmm? It's written in the, in the book of Genesis. And that happens because Cain killed Abel. And all the host of heaven wants to kill Cain because Cain killed Abel, which is the soul. Or the good aspect of the tree of life. So God is sending Cain out of Eden for a fornicator. Because through fornication is how Cain, the mind, Netzach, killed Abel, the soul, Tiferet. And in the story of Moses, Moses, before going into the Mount Sinai, before going into Jethro, his father-in-law, he kills an Egyptian. And Pharaoh and his people are looking for Moses in order to kill him because he killed an Egyptian. Do you see the similarity there? Both killed somebody else and now he is facing God. Hmm. It's all of us. It's a symbol of all of us. Cain is our mind. That's why Moses says that is the ruler of Netzach. Because Moses is willpower. It is superior manas. In order for that superior manas to emerge from us, we have to control behema, the mind, the donkey, as Jesus showed it in the Gospels, to enter into the hev heavenly Jerusalem, the Mount of Sinai. When Moses is reaching God there, he already is controlling his own particular individual Cain, the one that killed the Egyptian. That Cain that killed in the field Abel. Because the field alludes to sexuality. Yesod is the field. So therefore, Moses being there is an initiate that reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries. And is before his own particular God. His own particular God says, You created by following the doctrine of circumcision, your actual body, mental body, and causal body. Therefore, you are before me right now here because you build that causal body. Do you remember when you were Cain and I told you that you will be ejected because you were a killer of your own soul? And you told me, from your face I will hide. Now you are acknowledging your sins. You are acknowledging your defects, your vices. And all that evil thing that you have within. Right? So please, said God, don't come here as a sanctimonious person. Because you are not. You build. You were born again. Yeah. Thanks to be now. But not boast of being holy because you are not holy. You want to be one with me? 
Okay. Go down to Egypt. And liberate Israel. All the parts of your neshama. Then we talk. This is what happened to any in Egypt. But most of the initiates that reach the fifth initiation of mayor mysteries, they boast of it and they think that they are holy. Holy macaroni. <laughs> but not holy holy. Even though in English we say holy Moses. Yeah, but after he brings all Israel to the promised land and he dies, then he's holy Moses. Before that he is not holy. It's just anahema, or in other words, it says a haya, haya, life, uh, an individual, you know, because this is what we have to understand. In this world, we have hayot. That hayot is positive, it relates to Israel. As a single person, you work with your archetypes. Like, for instance, let us put in a good example of a single person that didn't want to practice sexual magic. Yogananda. He became a holy Hayot HaKadosh. But still animal. But Haya, Hayot. Do not mistake Hayot with the Behemoth. Behemoth is different. It's the cattle. Are the beasts of the earth that whether they are intellectual beasts or irrational beasts. But they are beasts. And they behave like beasts. They multiply like beasts and die like any beast. But somebody that reaches that level is a Haya Hayot. And Yogananda reached that holiness in his own level. He didn't create the astral, mental, and causal bodies. But like him, there are many people that work in the Haya level. Haya, Nefesh Haya. And in different levels. But the book of Genesis specifies. After that, L. Uh, visualization of Moses before God after we reach that level building the causal body and uh, if we take the direct path then we can reach the man into the image of God remember that because the man into the image of God is related with the sixth day not with the fifth the fifth you can be called human but it's a hasnamus. What is a hasnamus? A hasnamus is have human, have beast. Has something or a lot of behema inside. And a lot of creeping thin. Don't think that because somebody reached the fifth initiation of Mayor or Mysteries, this person has not behema within, has not the creeping thin within. They have it. That is related with Lilith in Nahema inside. To be coming to the image of God, we have to annihilate Behema completely, psychologically speaking. Because one thing is to conquer Behema physically in Yesod, Hod, Netzah, etc. But another thing is to conquer it in Gebura which is the next step. Because if we count the Sephiroth from the bottom, Malkut, Yesod, Hod, Netzah, Tifereth, then we are reaching the left side, which is Geburah, the fire. And of course, in Geburah, you have to descend. You want to perfect those archetypes that you have in Geburah? Well, they descended and mixed and mix with Nefesh to the left side of the tree of life and are slaves of the Pharaoh. So God is saying, Moses, is telling Moses, go down, liberate Israel, all those archetypes. And then you will 
be different. Because God is a unity. And Moses is still not Moses about another unity. Behold, see here the, the graphic, the seven graphic. Will we see the back of Prometheus, Lucifer, in Greek mythology? And Athena, the daughter of Jupiter, that emerged from his own head. Between them are making the man. The feminine and the masculine are making, are making the man there. According to Greek mythology. It is written that Prometheus made the man of clay. Remember that the Bible said the same thing. Making the man of clay, clay, the earth, the physicality. It says, And Ela Yam, the cigarette, said, Let us make Adam in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In other words, that man into the image of El Ayam and El Hayam, the two aspects of Bina, is that Adam that controlled the lower kingdoms, controlled the beasts of the earth, whether they are intellectual or not intellectual. The Haya are, of course, the other word that we said for animal. In other words, the initial has to acquire control, complete control of the tatwas. You see, when Moses is coming out of Egypt, out of Malkut, out of Mizrahim, and passing the two waters of Yesod into the promised land, he's showing the power that he developed. By annihilating Nahema, the white moon. Because this is how the initiate brings Israel into the physical world. Let us bring living souls out onto the earth means into our physicality. It means that the physical body has to become Nefesh Haya. When I say this, remember that when the book of Genesis addresses Nefesh Haya, living soul, is addressing the cattle, is addressing other animals in the earth, which are living souls, but not into the image of God. They are living souls, but not into the image of God. For instance, an eagle is a Nefesh Haya. It's a beautiful creature, the creation of nature, that has all the capabilities of being an eagle. A lion has all the capabilities of being an, a lion. An ox or a bull has all the capabilities of being a bull. It's an efesh haya. But when we reach the intellectual beast, or behema, intellectual behema, like the Bible says, or that creeping thing that is very abundant in this day and age, can we say, are these creatures nefesh haya in the sense of a human being? No. When we are in this level in which we are, we are weaker than an eagle, a lion, or a bull. Because we, de we don't have the, we are not Nefesh Haya. Because in order to become a Nefesh Haya into the image of God, we have to annihilate the animality within. And that is a task of Moses, as we explained in the previous lecture. You have to reach that level in which we are a Hasnamus. When I say this, 
Let us explain what a has namus is. I said, between human and between beast. And every single person in this physical world is a hanas mus, a has namus. But when you reach the fifth initiation of mayor ministers, you are in the danger of becoming a has namus of double polarity. And that is something that we have to explain and to understand. Please listen. One thing is to be a has namus because everybody is a has namus. But double polarity is a, the danger here. Means that the individual or walk as a master internally because he built the causal body. But in the physical world, his behema or her be behema, his beast, is awoken in evil and for evil. That means that has double polarity, awakening in two ways, in good and to evil. And that's precisely the danger. Because then in the, the individual here in the physical world, because he's awakened, he thinks, oh, I did the whole work already. Without realizing that he has those elements within. And to awake as a has namus with double polarity is to become a very dangerous individual. Fallen angels are hanas musen, plural. With double polarity. Personally, I had an experience with a very powerful has namus that in the Bible is named Moloch. His behema, bestiality, is very awakened. Relates to Geburah. Because it's a king that swallows the children. In the conjugation of the seven, we said, Begone for us, Moloch, we deny thee our children to devour. In Geburah. Those children are Israel. This is why we have to understand. Because when we follow and, and fall into awakening to the evil, all the children bottle up all the archetypes into hell. The archetypes of Israel. They are lost. Until that behema is disintegrated. Many fallen angels are like that. With that behemoth very strong. And that's why they are called Hasnamusen with double polarity. Understand that. And in order to address more this topic, it's coming into my mind, I had to say it. Mati Samael Onveor said, from Venezuela and Colombia only will come a harvest of Hasnamusen of double polarity. He said that. I didn't say it. I am just repeating. So we have to be careful. That's why Master Samael says, those that disintegrate the ego beforehand, meaning before reaching the level of Moses, the fifth initiation, are healed beforehand. That's why all of those that are still not reached that level, annihilate your ego. So when you reach the fifth initiation, no danger. Problem is to reach the fifth initiation with the ego very alive. With that creeping thing inside and behemoth inside, then the, we can deviate many souls. So the clue is not to follow anybody but only the Lord, Christ. So, the acquisition of the archetypes or the incarnation of Geburah who has the archetypes in the physical world, has two steps. But let me talk only about the first, which is related with the white moon. The initial has to annihilate the egos and all of that creeping thing related with the 96 lusts, related with the first sphere of, sphere of hell, which is called Yesod. 
Then, when he reaches that level of the annihilation of the eagles of the 96 laws, he incarnates Geburah. The incarnation of Geburah is only for those that annihilate those egos. And then the whole monad is incarnated in the physical world. This is how living souls comes into the earth related with initiation. Do not fall into the mistake of thinking because somebody reaches the fifth initiation is a living soul. No, it's not a living soul. It's just a master of the fifth initiation. In order to be a living soul, incarnated, or in other words, in order to be a reincarnation of a being, you have to reach the level of Moses, go down, work very hard in your physical world, and little by little, by the annihilation of the ego, crystallize, little by little, Gebura in you. And then we said, behold, a master that has the right now to enter into the second mountain. Before that, how are you going to enter into the second mountain? The second mountain relates to Lilith. All those creeping things that are not easy to find. You need a lot of consciousness in order to see them. That's why it is laughable and funny to see in this day and age people that didn't do that, not even annihilated the behemoth in themselves, and they said that they are Christs. When you observe them internally, they have the ego very fat. In Gnosticism, in this day and age, we only know one being that annihilated Nahemai Lilith within, Samael on the or, because he faced Kamaduro and Kamasaya. Kamasaya, karma of adultery. Kamaduro, karma of fornication. He died and resurrected. The rest who are in the path, we had to work a lot in the annihilation of the creeping thing in behemoth inside of us in order to reach Adam into the image and likeness of the one above. That's why in the graphic number 8 is written, so Elohim, we said the word Elohim here, because mean gods and goddesses, the two forces together, created Adam in their, their own image. In the image of Elohim created they Adam. You see the Adam is in the left side. That is precisely Shiva Shakti, the two polarities. Male and female created they them. They are Elohim because Elohim is Abba and Aima. Father and mother, creating their own image, which is the duality. The Adam androgynous. And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, Bear fruit and master and replenish the earth. In the Bible it's translated, Be fruitful and multiply. Because this world and Rava or Rabbi has many translations. It's in relation with multiplication as well. Hmm? And this uh, para means bear fruit or be fruitful. But now let us study this in order for us not to fall into confusion. It says, bear fruit. What is the element that bears fruits in this nature. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, or animal kingdom? Where do you see the fruits of the earth? In the plant kingdom. Right? So bear fruit means 
imitate the tree, the burning bush. That's why I said in my previous lecture, God is represented there as a yehi, the light that comes through the super dimensions and manifests into the physical plant kingdom. Because the plant kingdom, the elementals that are within the plant kingdom, never fornicate. They transmute. And that's why are filled of beautiful flowers and fruits. That's the outcome of chastity. That's why we said the tree of life, the burning bush. Because if we associate God with an animal, well, animals fornicate. Animals spill the sexual force. That's why in Kabbalah we associate the burning bush, the tree of life, God. Because every plant, and you will see now that we are approaching summer, how the plants will full of flowers and fruits. So when the commandment says unto those androgynous, bear fruit, well, the only element that bear fruit is a tree. I mean, bear fruit. It doesn't say ejaculate your semen, uh, be a fornicator. That's why, and master means to be a rabbi. To be a master means to develop mastery in order to replenish the earth, which is the physicality that we have. It doesn't mean that you are going to replenish the earth with a lot of children, as people think. Because in this day and age, you find a lot of people that understand this literally, and they study Kabbalah and multiply and have a lot of children. Thinking in that way, they are following the commandment. But to bear fruit as a tree is to transform the light of the cosmos as a tree in us and to develop the fruits of the tree of life in the spinal column, which are all the inner senses, the spiritual senses, and master them, which means rabbi. But if you take it literally, you said multiply and have a lot of children. That's easy. Why God is going to say have a lot of children, when we already have a lot of children. But to be a, bear fruit and to be a master of yourself, that's different. That's Moses. To be, develop your mastery. I mean, be, develop your perfection in mastery, in other words. By developing the fruits that you have within. And subdue the earth. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So anyhow, when you develop that, like Moses, you have dominion over the sea, as you see in Exodus. How Moses shows his power of the water, of the air, of the fire. He makes a column of fire in order to avoid the people that are fornicators, not to mix with the children. But anyhow, already some of them are mixed in the Exodus. The fall of the air, of the air are related to, of course, people that use the mind in their own way. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That is the real man into the image of God. The real man that control the forces of nature. Are we that Adam? We are not. But we can become. If we know how to utilize. The sexuality. So then. We have. The next statement of the sixth day of Genesis, where we find this graphic with the seven chakras that we showed it, uh, we showed it uh, in the, we showed it in the 
previous lecture, related with the seven tattvas, or seven chakras, in relation with that Adam that is developing the powers of the tattvas within themselves by following the doctrine of what we are teaching here. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. When you read this, if you read it literally, you will say, or I shall become a vegetarian. Only eating fruit and vegetables, right? No, that's not the meaning of it. Remember that every plant transforms the force of Yehi, of Yehida, in a positive manner. So there's plenty of energy there. So feed yourself with that energy. Because the seed in itself is the outcome of the transformation of that energy. That's why when you take the fruit of a tree, it's juicy, delicious. When you eat a plant, it's a lot of energy. So in this case, it's telling, telling to the initiates, feed yourself as a plant of the seed that is precisely the synthesis of Yehida and Haya, which is in nature. For that, we had to practice many exercises, but mainly the Tantra, in which you transform that energy in yourself and you are feeding your psyche. Because remember that you want to become Nefesh Haya, an Adam into the image the Salim of Yehida, of God. And for that, of course, you eat the seed. That seed is in you too. It doesn't say there that the tree is gelling the seed, but you have to eat that. To eat it is to transform it in yourself in the right way. Don't eat it as an animal. Because if you study the next graphic that is the number 10, behold there. This is taken from Buddhism, these graphics. But exactly fits the next verse. It says, first the initiates, now the rest of those that are not initiates, that are following just the mechanicity of nature. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fall of the air, intellectual, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, that we know what is that creeping thing, those people that work with the negative aspect of the sexual energy, when there is life, because all of us are with Haya, Chai, life, I have given every green herb for food. Means grass. You don't see there the seed, right? Of the grass. Just every green herb. No seed. For the initials, they have seed in the fruit. But here, only green grass. Because this is what the animal does. The seed of the grass is on top of it, but the behemoth, the bull, the donkey, the horse, and all those animals that are quadrupeds eat the grass with the seed. They transform it, and that's it. It's just to be alive, physically. But when we do it, we transform it. That's why it says, for the rest, only grass. Because if you ejaculate your sexual force, 
you are not taking the seed. You're just sustaining your physical life. And that's it. And of course, you find here the beast of the earth, the pig. The fall of uh, the air, the rooster. And the creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, the serpent. Is this coincidence? Or it is because it's taken from the same source? Because Judaism comes from Hinduism. Because Hinduism uh, is an ancient religion before Judaism. And many symbols, archetypes that we find in Hinduism are in Buddhism and Hinduism. And uh, this is why, because somebody asked me, why do you always associate Judaism with Buddhism or with Hinduism? Because Gnosis in this day and age is Buddhism and Christianity together. That is what is Gnosis in this day and age. Buddhism and Christianity. What is the root of Buddhism? Hinduism. What is the root of Christianity? Judaism. You see how always we address and, and point the other two religions? Because they are together. They associate. When we study the archetypes, we see that they associate to each other. Well, those beasts of the earth, fall of the air, and creeping things that are in the center of the wheel of Samsara follow the mechanicity of the moon, the mechanicity of the white moon, Nahema, the mechanicity of the black moon, Lilith. And they go into the cycles of devolution and evol uh, in evolution, which follows that wheel of Samsara. And of course, and Yehi was so. Because Yehi, Yehida, the light, returns always and illuminates life always. Whether we are submitted to the lunar mechanicity, when the ego is disintegrated in hell, Yehi, the light that is liberated in the abyss, returns to Yehida and is what saw. If we do it through our own will, then that light returns through our spinal column, like Moses. And yet he was so. Now, let us go into the 11 graphic. And Elohim saw everything that they had made, and behold, it was very good. You don't read that in the other days of Genesis. That that had made. Only in the sixth day. Because here is where all creation is done. When we do this, the whole creation is done. Made. But if we are in the fifth day, in the fourth day, in the third, second, or first, it is not made yet. It is just in process. And very good. You said that in Hebrew, Tov Me'od. Here we, we are hitting these two words. Of and Od, the two polarities of the light. Ob and Od, moon and sun, good and evil, positive and negative. So, that's why it says, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, if we ever reach the sixth day, and then we are very good. If we reach the fifth day, creating Moses, we are good. If we reach the fourth day, we are good too. If we reach the third day, we are good. Second day, we are neither good or evil. There's nothing there written that it was good. Because it's the Asad, the waters that are polluted. The first is good. But the sixth, very good. Tov Meod. Now let us read what the Zohar says about these two words. 
Tov me'od. This is the esoteric meaning of the words, and on him saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The word Tov, good, designates the angel, the Lord of life, right? Which is in the side, right side of the tree of life. The word Me'od, very, designates the angel, Lord of death, which is in the left. In the left side is Geburah, Samael, the Lord of death. The one that teaches you how to annihilate the ego. If you don't do it, he will take care of you in hell. By redemption, Tov, good, is strengthened. So what we are redeeming Israel from us, annihilating the ego. And of course, death is conquered with victory, as Paul of Tarsus says, because we are defeating ourselves here and now. And Meod, very, is weakened and has to no longer power over the child. Well, when you read that in the Zohar, have no power over the child, you might think, oh, my son, my child, my daughter. No, 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 no. Your child is Israel. It means that when you redeem yourself from any of the two moons, Lilith and Nahemah, between incarnated, trapped within those psychological elements that are ego, is one particle of Israel, a child. You annihilate the ego, you liberate that child. So death, death has no longer power over that child, over that particular archetype that you liberated. But you have to liberate all Israel until all Israel is conquering death. Or as we said in Kabbalah, is conquering Samael. Because this Logos can act mechanically in Klippoth, but initiatically, you are defeating the power of Samael in the lunar aspect, in the mechanical aspect. But thanks to him, you are comprehending your ego and you are, of course, liberating your children. Otherwise, the children of Israel will be swallowed by Moloch in Geburah. And that's sad because this is what happened with this humanity. You see the story of Moloch? If you read the Paradise Lost, you can find how this Moloch was fed with children, sacrifice on the altar. Of course, that has this esoteric meaning that I am explaining here. That is what is important. The children of Geburah are Neshama, all the aspects of Israel. Every time that you annihilate an ego, you liberate light, a child from Israel, and is no longer slave of Lilith or Nahemah. Otherwise, if you are a fornicator, still trapped into those moons that are uh, very common. So this is how we have to understand what the sixth day of Genesis is, to bring the souls into the earth. Do you have questions? Yeah. I have a question with regard to circumcision, um, particularly about Paul of Tarsus. Can you explain to, to us how in the church they say that Paul was sent out to preach to the Gentiles? One of the things he talked about was circumcision in his letter to the Romans. What does that mean? Because he says in that particular writing that he wasn't married. That's a very long question and very <laughs> it's good, but it is is it is good, it's a good question. But let me let me tell then give you an explanation about that because I read it too. P. 
Peter is a rock that the builders rejected. And of course, Peter relates to circumcision, but means to spiritual circumcision. Because in order to build the temple inside of you, which is the wife of God, you have to have the doctrine, the gospel of Peter, the secret of that is my tuna, sexual magic. If you reject the woman as a man, or a, a man as a woman, and then you are not following the doctrine of Peter, because you need to build the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Once the church is built, you have the choice to continue annihilating your ego as a single or Mary. That's up to you. Paul of Tarsus had that gift that he already, because he is the master Hilarion, and he created his inner bodies beforehand. And he was single. If I will like that all of you have the gift that I have, I mean the astral, uh, solar body, the mental solar body, and the causal body. But if you don't have it, well, it is better to you to marry than to burn in hell. Because if you don't build those bodies, you are condemned to go into the mechanicity of nature. This is what Paul says. And of course, because at that time, as in this time, still people think that if you receive the physical circumcision, then you are following the law of God. But I know, because I have friends in different parts of the world that are circumcised and that study Kabbalah. I have a particular friend in Canada that is an Orthodox. He study Kabbalah every Saturday. And he says that in order to be very well concentrated in the study of the Sohar, he smokes marijuana. I say, oh, well, good luck for you. You're going to study the Sohar with marijuana. This, are, you, are you stupid or what? No, no, no. But whatever you say, but I always feel concentrated with marijuana. I say, and you transmute your energy? No, because the rabbi didn't teach me that yet. I say, oh, well. So, of course, you are circumcised physically, but not spiritually. And that is just worthless. Many people that are circumcised men, but they don't follow the doctrine. So it's worthless. The Gentiles, Paul went and says, it is not necessary to do that physically. I will teach you how to be circumcised in the spirit. And Paul was teaching the Gentiles how to transmute, how to be circumcised in the spirit. But of course, the traditional Jews that follow Peter of the old law were contradicting them. In order for them to be really in the path, they had to be circumcised physically. And Paul says, no, it is not necessary. Like you, for instance. If you are circumcised, it's good. If you are not circumcised, it's good too. If you follow the law. But if you are circumcised and you are fornicating, well, you're just wasting your time. And if you are done multiplying your fruit of the tree of life in yourself, and to be a master, really, but you are just multiplying like the beast of the earth, thinking that that's the commandment, you are lost too. And justify yourself in many ways, right? But that's precisely the point here in your question. Circumcision is something that hides. To cut the skin of the phallus means to cut that beast reality that we have in order to transmute. And that was precisely the hidden mystery of the circumcision. But that uh, many people that follow, because not only the Jews circumcise themselves, but also the people from Islam. But all of them, I see them, you know, are children. I don't know if they are following the law, because there are many Gnostics that have children, but they are practicing. As the Master Samael says, in the past, I engendered my children, but now I cannot because I am following the path. That means that he engendered their children as any one of us. But once he entered into the path, he stopped doing or bringing children into the earth because he was following chastity. The Master explains that in one of his books. The same can happen with other Gnostics. That in the, in the beginning, they were trying, but they couldn't and they have a child. And then they said, let us try now, after nine months. Maybe now I will start doing it. And they can't. Another child. Let us start now, after other, other year. 
Maybe this time I will. I'm not a child. So I have friends. I have four and five children. And they are trying. And now they are succeeding. But many that started from the beginning have no children. Well, they started doing well. But it's because Behemoth has different strength in each one of us. Do you get that? Do you comprehend that? Another question? So this relates to the, the has the roots of the, the double aspect. So in today's society, we're taught that we, we, we associate ourselves with material personality. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one, one personality. That's behemoth. Mm -hmm. And if we actually do manifest that, we're considered insane. So, number one, how do we begin to recognize all of those egos that we need to eliminate? And number two, how do we eliminate those? So are there practical uh, things that we can do to eliminate those? When the one that has the power to eliminate those egos is the Divine Mother. Mm -hmm. That's the power. And the Divine Mother has the power in sex. But the Divine Mother, as you see the, the magic flute of Mozart, she appears like the queen of the moon, right? In the beginning, it is positive, but sometimes it turns, right? It is the nat nature that we have here in ourselves. We have to take advantage of the Divine Mother, but because she acts according to karma, according to mechanicity too. But if we worship her as Shekinah, she will annihilate us. Because she is also the mother death and will annihilate the ego. But she demands, in order to annihilate an ego of the white moon or the black moon, beforehand, comprehension. Which means you have to take the light, you have to take the child out of prison. That means comprehension, analysis, understanding of yourself, of that part of your consciousness which is trapped. And for that, you need to meditate. In meditation, you analyze every event of your life that relates to this ego that has trapped part of your consciousness. Then, when you comprehend it in meditation, and you are sure that you extracted the light already from that ego, that the child of Israel is with you, then you pray to your Divine Mother, Mother of mine, annihilate this ego. And of course, in order to Shekinah to be active in you, you have to be in chastity. Because no behema can ask the Divine Mother if he is fornicating. How is he going to annihilate? The power of the Divine Mother is the fire rising in the spinal column. The power of the serpent that was healing the Israelites in the wilderness. If you read the book of Numbers of Moses, it is written the story there when the Israelites were complaining. It says, serpents are biting us. And destroying us. Meaning of this is. The serpent. The seraphim from Geburah. That are related with fire. Are destroying our life. Because through lust. Through adultery. Through fornication. Are destroying our life. What we can do. And then it says. Moses go to God and says. What we can do. Because they are dying. Destroying themselves with. Too many ego of lust or lots of eagles. And then God says, build a serpent, another seraph. And whoever follows that seraph will be alive. Which means you have to worship the Shekinah in the manner that we are teaching here. And she awakes and has power to annihilate those lots of eagles that are bothering us. But we have to be patient. It's a systematic manner to annihilate. It's not that we are going to do it. You read the book of Exodus. You see how Moses was doing it. Before the Pharaoh and in the wilderness, etc. And all those problems that Moses conquered. Little by little, bit by bit. With patience, you will have your souls. Is what Master Jesus said. Because we are like in front of an anthill. Waiting for an end to come out of that hill. It comes one and you kill it. It comes another one, kill it. And you just shake that hill 
And it comes a lot. And you say, what am I doing? It's just a lot of eagles here. And you start with your, a lot of time to kill them with your nails, right? This is how we are. When we are in front of ourselves, we are like in an anthill. They have an ending. We have to be patient. Little by little. Until we kill all of those creeping things. Insects that come from the end hill. Your question? Uh, in, the, in the book of Boon, uh, it, talk, it talks about they, uh, the gods, they uh, do experiments to create men. And one of the first ones, <clears throat> they create, they create the, the beasts, right? They create different animals. They create the deer, and they name all these different animals. And then they don't praise God. They don't glorify his name, however they explain it. And um, for that, their punishment is their flesh shall be eaten. And yeah. So what is, what is this? How does this tie in with... Well, that has a relation with this lecture. Because the flesh is not only referring to the physicality. Because the flesh is also related to nefesh. And we have flesh also in the lunar bodies which is called the protoplasmic bodies, and the flesh in the physical body. We never worship God. But God always, Yehida is always making an experiment to create solar men. And when those people that do not become solar men, they are destroyed, like in different cycles, right? So obviously, to worship God means to liberate Israel from within our psychological defects in order to make that Israel one with God. That's the path. And the Popol Vuh talks about that too. So obviously there were men made of wood that were not following that. They were of course following just the mechanicity of nature and they were destroyed. The same this humanity will be destroyed if we are not following the path. Do you have questions here? Yeah. How can knowing our ray help annihilate the ego? How knowing our ray can annihilate the ego? Can help to annihilate the ego? Well, obviously the question is really with the seven rays because our monad relates to the seven mighty archangels which are the seven horns and the seven eyes of the Lamb according to the book of Revelation. To discover our own particular reign means is to discover the source to which our own particular glory and Christ is joined to. And of course, it depends any ray that you belong to, when you incarnate that particular force or glory and in the initiation of Tifereth, if you follow the direct path, then that uh, ray will be united with your monad and help you in your development. It could be, of course, the incarnation of one of the sparks of Samael. You are belong to the fifth. Or Michael, if you belong to the fourth. But remember, either way, any of the seven has always re relationship with the seven horns and seven eyes. Because the seven eyes in us are the seven chakras. And the seven horns are the seven serpents related with the seven bodies. So all of those seven horns and seven eyes of the Lamb are related with our own constitution. But our own monad particularly is related to one of those rays. And uh, if you incarnate that particular Glorian, if you ever reach the fifth initiation, and if you ever reach or follow the direct path, then that part of that Logos will be with you. And then you have to go down into Egypt and to face Pharaoh. And then to liberate in your physicality all the nefesh higher and to become an Adam into the image of God. Another lecture, another question? Was John Milton in Egypt? Unquestionably, he was. There's no way that he's going to write his lost paradise and paradise found without having the knowledge. 
And he describes and gives the Kabbalistic doctrine there in symbolism. Matthew Samael, who his mission was to unveil any book, hidden book, mysterious book written by many initiates. He mentioned Moses, he mentioned Krishna, he mentioned John Milton, and he addressed many authors, many initiates in his books in order to unveil the mystery. The mystery of uh, John Milton, uh, which I remember is related with the uh, Parsifal Unveiled. I mean, we translate the books of the master from Spanish into English, so we know that he's associated with many books because he has, as I said, the mission of unveiling what is veiling or what is veiled, in other words. The same thing that we are doing here. We are taking the book of Genesis, that is the book of the Gnostics, but we can take uh, Paradise Lost, but that will be very difficult because it's very Kabbalistic and profound and poetic, like the Divine Comedy. Master of Samael unveiled the Divine Comedy of Dante in, yes, there is devil, hell, and karma. That's a book. It's good. So, another question. In order to examine the tree of life practically in meditation, in Kabbalah, first, you have to be practical. You have to work with the mystery of that. Means chastity, sexual energy. That's the first requ requisite. The second is to annihilate the ego. In order to liberate light. As Gerda says, light, more light when he was dying physically. And it's because when he was alive, he was liberating the light from his own egos through chastity. So we had to say the same. Yehi, more yehi, more light for me, but meditating. Aim by not being selfish. By giving the doctrine to others. This is how we work with Kabbalah. And of course, there is a mantra that when you meditate, you can pronounce. Uh, Li, li faros, li faros, li faros, li canto, li goria. You find that in one of the books of the Master Samael related with uh, Kabbalah and alchemy. Vocalizing that mantra, you will penetrate in your own particular sephiroth. And everything that you discover there will be related with you. Because each one of us has different light related to the tree of life and to, related to the tree of good and evil, which is knowledge. Depends how you work, it's how you develop. Another question? Yeah. How long does it take for the fire to awaken? Is it different for everyone on the path? The fire in order to be awakened is different in every one of us. It depends on our own karma. It depends in which way are we working for humanity. That it doesn't depend of years or weeks, etc. That depends of the Holy Spirit. Because the one that awakes that fire is the Holy Spirit, which is a sexual force. And only He has the right to take the power of you or to give it to you. There are many Gnostics that uh, say that this person is no longer in the direct path or no longer in the path because this isn't that. And I always answer, listen, how do you know that? Are you the Holy Spirit? How do you know that? Do you investigate it? Oh, but the master such and such said in the past, oh, you are identified with the past? How long was that the master said that? And then he said, well, like 10 years ago. So you still think that that person cannot change? Just because the master said that he or she, whatever, he has the right to change. All of us are, the door of repentance is always open. And for their fruits, you will know them. Right? What fruits? Well, the fruits that we are talking about here. Bare fruits, like a tree of life. Another question? I feel my study of Kabbalah is too intellectual. Are there any good resources or books for this approach? The book of uh, Kabbalah is very intellectual, of course. Uh, the study of Kabbalah is very intellectual. Illuminated intellect. The question is to you, 
Are you lazy? The answer will be yes. Like all of these Christians in this day and age, Kabbalah is black magic, it's from the devil. Lazy, they don't want to study. They think that they are saved just by believing in Jesus. They go into devolution. But in order to know the Bible, as we're spending here, you have to study Kabbalah. There's no way. Behold all the millions of Christians sharing the Bible. Do they follow the path? No. Why? Because they ignore Kabbalah. Oh, because Kabbalah is very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. And I'm telling you that for direct experience. Do you think that this knowledge that I have, I was born with it? Or I developed it? How do I develop this knowledge? By snoring? By going to McDonald's and eating McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken and enjoying life, going to Paris? Is this how I develop this knowledge? No. If we are lazy, of course, we are not going to develop. Or too much intellect. Yeah, it is true. Follow the Master Samael on Beor. He has studied the Sohar. He has studied the Divine Comedy. He has studied the Paradise Lords of Milton. He has studied all the Masters. You found, when I was in his home, I saw all his library. But you think that those books of those masters of esotericism and religions, were they just there in order to show off themselves? She was studying them. He was unveiling them. That's why a lot of his books talk about that. So the example of Master Samael, he was really a serious student in order to give the knowledge to humanity. This is how we understand this. But if we don't want it, of course, well, there's other, other initiatives that said this is not necessary. Just follow this, follow that, and burn all the books of the Master Samael. They, they are not necessary. The one that said that is a donkey. I mean, that we study here, that are walking evil and for evil. Another question? No more? Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,